you know. Um, but yeah, I think that's a combination of some faculty members might not have experience or the technology or both experience with the technology. Um, so it will be more difficult for them to, to do this type of thing. Um, so yeah, let's see. Okay, welcome back. Today it's been raining a lot through through the night. So I was expecting low attendance because of all the rain. I was not sure whether or not, because typically when something like this happens, like we get all these notifications through the night, um, the university will open late. So that was not, not the case today. Uh, so we go back. Uh, let's see. So we are going to continue our discussion on the simplex algorithm. We started this discussion on Wednesday last week. And we basically describe the the way the algorithm works, the theory behind the algorithm. And now we are going to show the, the steps. And we are going to present some examples. So remember the idea of this algorithm is to um, see so you, yes, just one minute. Uh, so let's continue with the with the lecture. Um, so again, the the idea with the simplex algorithm is to solve problems that have more than two decision variables. So we we already discussed the graphical method, and now we're going to transition to larger problems, and we're going to solve them using the simplex algorithm. So this is for linear programming models. Uh, with you you can still solve problems with two decision variables, but the idea is to apply this to larger problems. Uh, so we are going to use the simplex algorithm to solve linear programming models with more than two variables. And we already went through the process of defining the, the theory behind the algorithm. So today we're going to go and straight to, to the steps. So let's go there. Everything that is I'm showing right now was discussed on Wednesday last week. So we are going to start from here. So the, the algorithm. So here are the steps. This is the simplex algorithm procedure for maximization linear programs. Uh, so you will see that some of the steps are going to be adapted if you are solving a minimization problem. The steps that are listed in this slide are for maximization. So the first step will be to convert the linear programming model to a standard form. So we know how to, to do that. We're gonna look at the constraints and we're gonna make sure that all those constraints are equalities. Then we're gonna obtain a basic feasible solution if possible from the standard form. So we're gonna obtain initial solution 
from this standard uh, formulation. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. And then we're gonna, based on that initial solution, we're gonna determine whether or not that basic feasible solution is optimal. So finding an initial solution, we, we check if that initial solution is optimal. If that's the case, then we, we are done. If not, then we have to check for, for other solutions. So if the current basic feasible solution is not optimal, we are gonna determine which non-basic variable should become a basic variable and which basic variable should become a non-basic variable to find a basic feasible solution with a better objective function. So remember from our discussion last time on Wednesday, we were um, assigning values of zero to the basic variables and we were finding different corner points. So every time we did a combination, we were looking for a different point in the feasible region. So the idea with the algorithm is the same. So we're gonna start with an initial solution. We check whether or not that is an optimal solution. If that's not the case, then we're gonna proceed with uh, some mathematical computations to find a adjacent point in the feasible region um, to, and check then if that new point is an optimal solution or not. And we're gonna continue that process until we find the optimal solution. So we're gonna use the elementary row operations from the Gauss-Jordan method or the E rows to find a new basic feasible solution with a better objective function value. We find the better, uh, an improvement, an improved solution. We check if, if that is a, an optimal solution or not. So that's step three. And we continue this process until we find that optimal solution. Okay, so again, we start with putting the problem into standard form. Using that um, format, we try to find an initial solution, basic feasible solution. We check if that basic feasible solution is optimal. If it is not optimal, then we're gonna proceed at changing the, the basic variables and non-basic variables. We're gonna find a new combination of basic variables and non-basic variables. We check if that new point that is given by that new combination is optimal. If the answer is yes, we are done. If the answer is no, then we go back to step three and continue the process until we're done. Uh, so again, an iterative process to find this optimal solution. The steps here are listed for the simplex algorithm procedure. So in performing the simplex algorithm, we write the objective function in the form, uh, in this form. So if you remember, we typically have an objective function in this way. So in performing the simplex algorithm, basically what we are doing is moving that right-hand side to the left. So we need to state the objective function in this form. So now Z, which was used to uh, name the objective function, is used a, as a variable in, in the objective function. So we are moving CX1 plus CX2 to the left-hand side of that equation. And we call this format the row zero version or row zero for short of the objective function. Okay, so we put the, the, the constraints into standard form. And we also write the objective function in this uh, row zero version uh, of the objective function. Okay, so, so let's look at one example and let's see how this algorithm proceeds. So we have um, a furniture company that manufactures desks, tables, and chairs. The manufacture of each type of furniture requires lumber and two types of steel labor, finishing and carpentry and the amount of each resource needed to make each type of furniture is given in this table. So we have the resource and we know the amount of uh, material, in this case, lumber that is used per, per type. So desk requires eight force feet, uh, table six and chair one. And then we have information about uh, the operations that needs to be performed and how long 
is needed for each one of those operations, depending on the type of product that you're going to make. So those are going to be our constraints. Those are the, the right hand side. Um, I'm sorry, those are the, the coefficients that are tend to be associated with each product. And then at present, 48 board feet of lumber, 20 finishing hours, and eight, eight carpentry hours are available. So those are telling us these are your capacity limitations, right hand side of your constraints. Uh, a desk sells for $60, a table for $30, and a chair for $20. Dakota believes that the demand for desks and chairs is unlimited, but that most buy tables can be sold. Since the available resources have already been purchased, Dakota wants to maximize the total revenue. So we're gonna formulate and solve an LP to maximize the total revenue for this company. So now you're familiar with formulation. So you can see easily that we're gonna have an objective function that is trying to maximize the, the revenue. We have the price uh, for each product. So we're gonna use those coefficients and we're gonna define a decision variable that is going to be tied to the number of products per type that we're gonna sell. And then we have three constraints that are associated with our limitations for materials and operations. So our decision variable, Again, are the number of desks produced, number of tables produced, and number of shares produced. So three type of products. Now we are dealing with a problem that has more than three, two decision variables. So we can no longer use the graphical method to solve this. And we want to maximize the, the profit, 60x1. So with the maximization of Z equals 60x1 plus 30x2 plus 20x3. And again, the capacity limitations for the material, which is lumber. We have up to 48 to use. Uh, and we have the finishing constraint for the time available and the carpentry constraint for the um, amount of time that we have available. And then last constraint is the demand constraint. So we say that at most five tables will be sold. So any question about the formulation? I think at this point, everybody should be familiar with this type of, of formulation. Uh, you have a profit at the top, you wanna maximize the profit and you have three constraints that are associated with your capacity limitations in terms of materials and time availability. And then one constraint that is associated to the demand for one of the products. And then we have the non-negative constraint for X1, X2 and X3. Okay. So now we set up the problem. As we mentioned, the first step of the algorithm is to set up your objective function in the row zero version. It is called row zero because we are gonna use a table format to solve this problem. And that's what, we're, what I'm trying to illustrate in this slide. We have a table format in which we are naming every row. So you see the row at the top is row zero. That row zero is always associated with the objective function. And you see the format of the objective function, it is in the row zero format, which is what I mentioned in this slide. Okay, so now we have the objective function and we are moving the right-hand side of the objective function to the left side. So those coefficients for uh, C, X1, uh, that, that coefficient C1 is negative now and that coefficient C2 is negative now because they are moved to the left side. So that's what you're gonna see here in the first row or row zero, I'm sorry, row zero. And then row one, row two, and row three, and row four are rows associated with each one of the constraints. So we have row one for constraint number one, and you see that we are making that inequality now by adding that slack variable. And we do add a slack variable for each one of the constraints because those constraints are on, of this format, okay? So now we have the problem in the, um, in the format that we need to, so we can apply the algorithm. So you see, uh, we have four rows associated row one, row two, row three, and row four are associated with the constraint. Row zero is associated with the objective function. 
and everything is, is equal to the, the right hand side of the constraint. So for the objective function, that will be zero for the uh, row one is 48 and so on. Any questions about this setup? Okay, so the, the next step now, after converting this to a standard form is to find an initial solution for this problem. And if you remember from our discussion last Wednesday, we were able to find different corner points of the feasible region by assigning basic variables equal to zero and then solving for the rest. So we are gonna do the same thing here. If we set x1, x2, and x3 equal to zero, we can solve for the values of S1, S2, S3, and S4. Thus, we can make those four decision variables our basic variables and the non-basic variables X1, X2, and X3. Each constraint is in canonical form for a negative, uh, a non-negative right-hand side. In a canonical form, in a canonical form, the basic variables have a coefficient of equal to one in one row and zero in all other, in all other rows. Therefore, a basic feasible solution can be obtained by inspection. So but basically what we are saying here is since we have the slack variables, we can easily find an initial solution for this problem. That will not be always the case, but in the case in which you have a slack variable assigned to each one of the constraints, then you can use the slack variables to find an initial solution. How do you do that? Well, remember we have um, four constraints and seven decision variables. So seven minus four is three. So we can assign three decision variables equal to zero and so for the rest, which is what we are doing in this plot. So we made um, that those three decision variables equal to zero, x1, x2, and x3, because those are the ones associated with the coefficients. So by making those equal to zero, we are basically taking all the coefficients out of the equations and we can, and we keep, like basically what I'm saying is, if we make x1, x2, and x3 equal to zero, all this is gonna be equal to zero. And then you're gonna have a solution, a simple solution for this set of equations that solution is S1 equals 48, S2 equals 20, S3 equals six, and X4 equals five. And that's the easiest way to find an initial solution for this problem. If you make X1, X2, and X3 equal to zero, then you know that the, S, the slack variables are gonna be equal to the right-hand side of the, of the equations. And that's an initial solution. So we find that initial solution by inspection. So to perform the simplex algorithm, we need a basic, not necessarily non-negative variable for row zero. Since C appears in row zero with a coefficient of one and C does not appear in any other row, we use Z as the basic variable. With this convention, the basic feasible solution for our initial canonical form has this format, Z equals um, Z or the basic variables are Z, S1, S2, S3, and S4. And the non basic variables are X1, X2, and X3. And for this initial basic feasible solution, you will see that the objective function value will be equal to zero because our decision variables X1, X2, and X3 are equal to zero. So when you put that into the objective function, that objective function is going to be equal to zero. And we have the decision variables S1, S2, S3, and S4 equal to the right-hand side of the constraints. Note that a slack variable can be used as a, as a basic variable if the right-hand side of the constraint is non-negative. Okay, so all this process, basically, what I'm trying to say is we need to find an initial solution and the easiest way to find an initial solution is to make the x equal to zero and solve for the slacks. And we get this, this initial solution. Um, so the question now is, which is step three, determine if the current basic feasible solution is optimal. So we know that if X1, X2, and X3 is equal to zero, that solution cannot be optimal. Basically your profit is zero. So there has to be something better than that. Once we have obtained a basic feasible solution, we need to determine whether it is optimal. 
So to do this, determine if there's any way Z can be increased by increasing some non-basic variable from its current value of zero while holding all the other non-basic variables at the current values of zero. Solving for Z in row zero yields this equation. And you remember, this is the objective function. We know that right now X1, X2, and X3 are non-basic variables. So those are equal to zero. Right now, X1, X2, and X3 are equal to zero because we have made them no basic variables. So for each non-basic variable, we can use the equation above to determine if increasing any non-basic variable, meaning X1, X2, and X3, while holding all the other non-basic variables equal to zero, will increase Z. And the answer is yes. If you increase X1 by one, just by one, what will be the value of Z? If you make X1 equal to one, 60, right? So right there, you see that if you make, if you increase X1 from zero to one, your objective function will increase rapidly. It will go from zero to 60. Same thing for X2. If you make X2 equal to one, your objective function will go from zero to 30 just by making that increase. And same thing for X3. If you go from X3 equal to zero to one, that will increase your objective function from zero to 20. The question is, if you were to increase one of them, you cannot increase them all, all of them at the same time. You can increase one of them. If you were to increase one of them, which one would you increase? X1, correct. Because that's the one that is giving you the better performance in terms of increasing your profit. And that's the step that we're gonna do now. So we know that we have an initial solution, right? We have an initial solution that is given here. This solution, okay, we found this initial solution. We make X1, X2, X3 equal to zero. We know that's feasible, that's point zero, that's the origin in the, in the uh, feasible region. So we are trying to say, okay, we have an initial solution. We knew we can do, we know that we can do better. Uh, so let's see, based on the basic, non-basic variable that I have, X1, X2, and X3, if I increase any of those, will I increase my objective function? The answer is yes, you can increase any of them. If you increase X1, you will increase your objective function to 60. If you increase X2, you will increase your objective function to 30. If you increase X3, you will increase your objective function to 20. So any of those will give you a better objective function that zero, than zero. So we need to select now the best out of that group. And as you answer already, increasing X1 gives you the, the greatest rate of increase for Z. So if X1 increases by from its current value of zero, it will have to become a basic variable. So now we say, okay, X1 is a non-basic variable. I know it's a non-basic variable, that's, that's why it is equal to zero. But I know if I increase X1, I will improve my objective function. But in order for me to increase X1, I need to make it a basic variable. I need to remove that, um, let me take some notes. Here. So basically what's happening is I have two sets, basic variables, non-basic variables. So in the non-basics, I have X1, X2, and X3. I know that if they're, if they're part of this set, these have to be zero, this has to be zero, and this has to be zero. However, the basic variables, which are Z, S1, S2, S3, and S4, they don't have to be zero. They can assume other values. But if they're non-basic, they have to be zero. So for me to increase X1, in order for me to be able to increase X1, which I know if I increase that X1 value just by one, that will improve my objective function. So if I make X1, equal to one, I know my objective function will be 60. So I know that will give me an improvement. But in order for me to do that, I need to make X1 part of the basic variable. And I need to find one of these 
one of those have to switch places with X1. Okay, so in order for me to, so I found an initial solution, right? It's not the best. I found one non-basic variable that can improve my solution. So the question now is how I flip this? How do I make X1 part of that non-basic, that basic set, basic variable set? And how do I decide which one of the, of the basic will become a non-basic variable? Okay, so if I increase, if X1 increases from its current value of zero, it will have to become a basic variable. For this reason, X1 is called the entering variable. So X1 will enter the basic. Observe that X1 has the most negative coefficient in row zero. So if we go back to here, to the original table, this is what we are referring to. If you go to row zero, X1 has the largest negative coefficient, which is negative six. And we are gonna use that information for the algorithm. So basically everything that I just explained becomes a step. You will go check the row zero and you will see if there's negative values there. If the answer is yes, you will pick the one that has the, the highest value or the highest number. In this case is minus 60. And that's the basic variable that will, will have to become the non-basic variable that will have to become a basic variable. So you will see that everything that I'm, I mean, I'm giving you all the explanation, but at some point this will be very straightforward. So you go do step one, step two, step three, and you solve the problem. But in order for you to understand those steps, I need to give you this uh, explanation. So, so why are we doing those things? That's, that's, that's the question that we are answering right now. So we find the entering variable and observe that X1 has the most negative coefficient in row zero. Okay, so we choose the entering variable in a maximization problem to be the non-basic variable with the most negative coefficient in row zero, which is what I just showed you in the table. If you go to row zero and you find the non-basic variables, the current non-basic variables, you will see that all of them will have a coefficient associated with them. That will be always the case. If, if it is a basic variable, the coefficients in row zero will be zero. But if it's the non-basic variable, you will have a coefficient that is different than zero. You will choose the most negative one coefficient in row zero. That will be the entering variable. That will be the basic, the non-basic variable that will become a basic variable. Uh, if there's ties, you can broke them arbitrarily. So if you had two non-basic variables with the same negative coefficient, you can choose either one. That you don't have, I mean, you, you choose any of those. We desire to make X1 as large as possible, but as we do, the current basic variables, S1, S2, and S3, and S4 would change value. So if you go back to our uh, analysis here, Obviously we know that X1, if you increase X1, that will increase your objective function faster, right? Because X1 is associated with 60. So you wanna make X1 as big as possible, right? You wanna make that X1 as big as possible, but you know you have some constraints that you have to meet. So we will have to find that limit for increasing X1. Um, so we, 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 be, we still have a solution that is feasible, that is meeting all the constraints. And that's the next step. We decide to make X1 as large as possible, but as we do, the current basic variable S1, S2, S3, and S4 will change value. Thus increasing X1 may cause a basic variable to become negative, okay? And we cannot allow that. We have to make sure that as we increase X1, all the other decision variables remain positive. Okay, so there's gonna be a limit for us to increase X1. We cannot increase this to infinity, right? So becoming a negative and non-basic becoming negative meaning will mean that you're getting outside your uh, feasible region. So in order for us to uh, find out what will be the, the maximum or, or the limit 
for us to increase x1, we have to perform this operation, which is a ratio test. So from row one, we see that x1 is going to be equal to 48 minus x minus 8x1. And that is, again, if you go back to here, let me show you. So we are assuming, okay, so we are looking at this right now. S1 equals 20, S3 equals eight, and S4 equals five. And we know those are the equations because X1, X2, and X3 are gonna be equal to zero, right? So we know S1, we know X1 is entering, right? So we want to know, how far we can go in increasing this number. So uh, we don't, our problem does not become invisible or not visible. So we're gonna have to look at that piece that I just highlighted from the table. And we are going to look at how X1 is gonna impact that expression. Because if I increase, as I increase X1, I need to make sure that that doesn't make X1 less than zero. Okay, so I have to make sure that all my decision variables are greater or equal to zero. So the way that I proceed is, I know I'm going to increase X1, so I'm going to look at the impact of X1 into this uh, value of S1, S2, S3, and S4. So if you go to the equations for uh, row one, The, for row one, the coefficient associated with x1 is eight. For row two, the coefficient associated with x1 is four. And for row three, the coefficient associated with uh, x1 is two. So when you look at this, that's why we have this coefficients here. Okay, so if I want to make sure that s1 remain positive, I can solve this uh, for X1 and find the maximum value that X1 can assume while keeping S1 positive. And that's what we are doing here. We are solving for X1 and we do what we call the ratio test in which we are dividing the coefficient of S1 by the coefficient of X1. And we are saying, okay, X1 can be, for Equation one, for S1 to remain positive, X1 has to be less than or equal to six. For the second row, or for the second constraint, S1, I'm sorry, S2, X1 has to be less than or equal to five to make, to remain, for S2 to remain positive. And for the third coefficient, for S3, for S3 to remain positive, X1 has to be greater, less than or equal to A divided by two, which is equal to four. Those coefficients are telling me the maximum amount that I can increase X1. So my slack variables, S1, S2, and X3 remain positive. Remember that second string for our problem, the slack variables have to be positive. So in this case, the ratios are six, four, five and four. This means to keep all the basic variables down negative, the largest we can make X1 is the minimum of these three coefficients. So that minimum is gonna be equal to four. If we make a five, we know that S3 is gonna be negative and that's going to make the problem feasible. If we make a six, we know S2 and X3 are gonna be negative. So that's gonna make the problem invisible. So we have to choose the minimum out of those three ratios. The minimum is four. If we make X1 four, we know that all the slack variables will remain positive. They're gonna be greater or equal to zero. So we call this the ratio test. I call it the minimum ratio test or MRT. When entering a variable into the basis, compute the ratio, which is gonna be equal to the right-hand side of the row 
divided by the coefficient of the entering variable in that row. For every constraint in which the entering variable has a positive coefficient, the constraint with the smallest ratio is called the winner of the ratio test. And the smallest ratio in the, is the largest value of the entering variable that will keep all the current basic variables non-negative. Make the entering variable x1 a basic variable in row three, since this row constraint was the winner of the ratio test a divided by two, which is equal to four. Okay, so all this will make more sense as we solve the problem in a few minutes. Um, to make x1 a basic variable in row three, we use the elementary row operation. So this is the gauss jordan method. Here's where we get we uh, everything that I've been telling you since the beginning of the semester, we need the gauss jordan method. We need to understand linear algebra. Here's where we are gonna need that. To make x1 a basic variable in row three, we use the elementary row operations to make x1 have a coefficient of one in row three and a coefficient of zero in all other, the other rows. This procedure is called pivoting on row three and row three is called the pivot row. The final result is that x1 replaces x3 as a basic variable for row three. The term in the pivot row that involves the entering variable is called the pivot term. Okay, so let's work with this. And maybe now use the gauss jordan method. Uh, simplex tableau makes x1 um, a basic variable. You're gonna see that on the next slide. But as I mentioned already, we are gonna set up our problem into the standard form, and we're gonna set up everything in terms of a table. Okay, so I have a column here that I'm gonna to use to name my basic variables. So in this case, S1, oh, this is for Z, this is for S1, S2, S3, and S4. Those are my basic variables and they are associated with, S1 is associated with row one, S2 is associated with row two, S3 is associated with row three, and S4 is associated with uh, row four. All these empty spaces are zero. So let me, in, and you're going to have access to these nodes. Okay, so these are zeros. This is a zero. Zero. Okay, so what I want you to observe from here, you know, the basic variables are in this case, S1, S2, S3, S4, and Z. These are my basic variables, okay? So those are the ones that are listed here in the first column. Not in that order, Z should be first, but they are the that's the set of basic variables. Those are the variables that are different, their value is different than zero. And you can see, or greater or equal to zero. So you can see S1 equals 20, S3 equals eight, and S4 equals five. What I want you to observe is for those basic variables, you see them listed here at the top, S1, S2, S3, and S4. If you look at, and also Z, if you look at the format of those columns, you'll see that those are zeros and ones, okay? So if you're going to identify your basic variables from, from this setup, you will see that you will have an identity matrix associated with your basic variable. And that's always true. If you want to see your table, you wanna identify your basic variable, you will see that those form an identity matrix. So you can see here, this piece is part of the identity matrix and this is the last column. They will be no part of the, they will not be part of the identity matrix if it is a non-basic. Yeah, 
So we, we are not solving yet. I'm, I'm just illustrating the, the setup. Yeah. Say that again. Yes. That's my identity matrix. Yes, that's my, my, I chose that initial solution because I set up the rest of them equal to zero. So in order to solve for that initial solution, the easiest way to do that is to set up your X coefficients equal to zero and then solve for the slash. And then if you were to like, Yes, yes. So that's what we're going to do now. We're going to, now we, since we want to enter x1 into the basics, we need the elementary row operations for this column to be similar or to be part of the identity matrix. So I need to make this column zeros and ones. And then one of these columns or one of these basic variables are going to become a non-basic variable in which that column will not be zeros and ones anymore. It will have different values of the data stream. Okay. So the question, once I set up everything nicely like this, I know my Slack variables are part of the identity matrix with that Z. Uh, you can see also that when I name my rows, you see that S1 in row one, this one that I just marked, that S1 is associated with this one. So you see, let me, let me just use a different color here. So S1 right here, if you look at the one, that's where these two S1 intersect. So the one is associated with row one. This S2 is also intersecting with this S2. This S3 is intersecting with S3 and S4 is intersecting with this four. Okay. So row one is associated with that basic variable S1. Okay. So let me take all this from here. And now the question is, I know that I can improve this solution based on my explanation. You see that you have some negative coefficients in row zero. So that's telling you that you still can improve this solution. So if you look at this coefficient, this coefficient, and this coefficient, all of them are negative. They are different than zero. So we have some, uh, we can improve this solution. And we're gonna choose X1 to enter the basic variable set. Right now it's a non-basic because it has the largest negative coefficient in row zero. So again, based on my explanation, what that means is if you increase X1 by one, you're gonna increase your objective function by 60. And if you compare against X2 and X3, none of them will beat that. If you increase X2 by one, it's gonna increase only by 30. If you increase X3, it's just gonna increase by 20. So X1 is the one that is giving you the best performance. So that's why I wanna make X1 a basic variable. So X1 is gonna enter the basic variable. I want X1 to become part of this set. Right now it's not part of that set, okay? So I need X1 to enter. Now I need to decide which one is going to leave, okay? So I if enter if X1 is gonna enter, one of these basic variables have to leave. So I need to choose which one will leave the basic variables. In order for me to find that, um, in order to find that, I had to perform the minimum ratio test. 
which is why I illustrated here in this slide. This one. Okay, so that's the explanation, the minimal range of that. Okay, so, um, so X1 is entering. If I perform the minimum ratio test, I'm going to divide this right-hand side by the coefficient associated with X1. So that's 48 divided by eight. Then this coefficient divided by this coefficient as 20 divided by four. Then this coefficient divided by this coefficient, that's eight divided by two. And in this case, I have five divided by zero. So this, that one is undefined. We cannot divide by zero. So we don't take that one into account. That this one is undefined. We cannot divide by zero. So this is gonna be six, this is five, and this is four. And if you remember, we are gonna choose the minimum between six, five, and four. That's the minimum ratio test. And the minimum, we call it here, minimum ratio test, the minimum between six, five, and four. So the minimum is four. So that means that S3, because the minimum ratio test is associated with S3, S3 is going to leave the basic variables. So we choose the one that is entering, looking at the largest negative coefficient in row zero. We choose the one that's gonna leave based on the minimum ratio test. So in this case, the minimum ratio test is associated with four. So four belongs to S3. So S3 is going to leave the basic variables. So the question now is how do we make X1 basic and how do we make S3 a non-basic variable? So here are the steps and bear with me. We're gonna go through each one of these tables um, step by step. Okay, so as I mentioned here, the basic variables are part of the identity matrix. So if I want to make X1 part of the basics, I have to make this column a column with zeros and ones. So in this case, I have to make this column like this. Why? Because X1 is gonna take the place of S3. So S3 has this format. So X1 is gonna take that place now. So I need to make that column equal to the column of S3. Okay, so what that means is that this is my original column. Mm, 68, 42. I think I added an extra, yeah, it's too many zeros here. This column will see zero, 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 one, and zero. So this minus 60 will become a zero. This will be zero. This will be zero. This will be zero. And this one is zero already. So I need to transform this column into this. Okay. And in order for me to do that, I will use the elementary row operation. That makes sense. And that's why I need linear algebra. Because I need to reformat all these coefficients 
make that column 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, because it's taking the place of S3. So I need to do some linear algebra computations to get that format. And that's what we have on the next slide. Those steps. Okay, so let me, so again, this is going to be my basic variable. This is what I call my pivot. So I know this is the value that will be Z, uh, one, I'm sorry. And the rest of the column will be zeros. This is zero already. Um, so let me complete this so you don't get confused. So this is zero. And I'm going to have a new column here called basic variables. Should be zero. And this is Z, this is S1, S2, S4, and guess what? Now, instead of S3, we have X1 here because X1 is going to take the place of S3. Okay, so in my basic variables now, instead of having S3 in that fourth row, I have X1. So the first thing I'm going to do is to multiply row three by one half. That will make this coefficient equal to one. Originally, that was equal to two. But as you see, when you do that, you're multiplying the entire row by one half. So that is also changing the coefficient for S3. So it's no longer one, now it's one half. Okay, so now I have S1, uh, X1 equals one for uh, column X1. And the next steps are going to do the process to make the rest of the column equal to zero. So this column right here will become all zeros, except for that one that we just assigned to X1. Okay, so the next step will be to make this, um, let me complete all this. So you don't get confused. So all the empty spaces should be equal to zero. So I'm just filling those for you so you don't get confused. Uh... Okay. And this basic variable column is not gonna change. Okay, it will be remain the same for the for all the tables here. Uh, what I want you to, to observe now is that the next step will be to make minus 60 equal to zero. So now we are dealing with the highlighter. So the next step is to make minus 60 equal to zero. And that's the operation that we are performing. We are multiplying 60 times row three and add it to row zero. And that's how this become zero. If you see the row zero value now, this is what's telling you the profit. If you look at row zero on the right hand side, this right here is zero. When you perform the operation to make this one zero, 
your right hand side is now telling you your profit just increased from zero to 240 by making X1 uh, a basic variable. <clears throat> so the next step would be to make this one equal to zero. So you do that by multiplying row three minus eight times row three and add it to row one. So we get this zero right here. And then the last step is to make this one equal to zero. So you do the minus four times row three and add it to row two. And that, that will make that equal to zero. And now you can see that we have that column in the format that we needed to. So now X1 is a basic variable. Again, let me write the So these are the basic variables, Z, S1, S2, X1, and S1. So now we have X1 in the format that we need to. And as you can see now, by making X1 equal to four, my objective function now is 240. So we have improved our solution. And from our initial solution said that we have a profit of zero by increasing X1 to four, we are now, we now have an, an improvement in terms of the profit. The profit now is 240. Are we done? That's the question. The answer is no. Why is that? Okay, so if we go back to the canonical form, we now get this. We have, if we substitute these coefficients from this last tableau into the equations again, this is how the problem will look like. Our objective function, is positive 15x2 minus 5x3 plus 30s3 equals 240. And using the coefficients for row one, row three, row two, row three, and row four, this is how the, the equations would look like after the first iteration. Um, so my basic variables are S1 equals 16, S2 equals four, X3, X1 equals four, and S4 equals five. Remember that my non-basic variables are equal to zero, right? So if I make my non-basic variables equal to zero, I can solve for the basics. So that gives me X1 equals 16, S2 equals four, X1 equals four, and S4 equals five. So in the canonical form one, the basic variables are S, are Z, S1, S2, X1, and S4, which are the ones associated with row one. So this is row one is S, sorry. This is S1, S2, X1, and S3, as S4. Those are my basic variables. So at Z, S1, S2, X1, and S4 are my basics. Non-basics are the rest. So yielding the basic basic feasible solution Z equals 240, S1 equals 16, S4 equals four, X1 equals four, and S4 equals five. And the non-basic variables equal to zero, S3, X2, and X, X2, and X3. The procedure from going to one basic feasible solution to a better adjacent basic feasible solution is called an iteration or pivot of the simplex algorithm. So we just completed one iteration. So after including X1 as part of the basics and removing uh, S3 from the basics, we completed one iteration. The question is, can we improve this solution? We have a better profit, but can we do better? Returning to step three, we attempt to determine if the, if the current 
if the current basic feasible solution is optimal. So rearranging row zero from canonical form one and solving for A yields this. 240 minus 15 X2 plus five X3 minus 30 S3. So this is basically putting this equation here at the top in this format. Okay, so we are putting them, put it in everything on the, on the right hand side. So we are arranging row zero. Um, we get this expression. The current basic feasible solution is not optimal because increasing X3 to one while holding the other non-basic variables to zero will increase the value of C. Basically, if we make X2 we know is non-basic, the non-basic variable, this is a non-basic variable. Um, so those are equal to zero. But if we increase this one um, by one, we know that that will increase your profit by five. So what that means is we can still improve this solution if we make X3 different than zero. So making either X2 or X3 basic will cause the value of Z to decrease. Step four, recall the rule for determining the entering variable in row zero coefficient with the greatest negative value. Since X3 is the only variable with a negative coefficient, X3 should be entered into the basis. So when I say a negative coefficient, if you go back to this table, after we complete the first iteration, after completing the first iteration, If we look at this row, row zero, how do we know if we completed the process or if, how do we know that if this is the optimal solution or not, we're gonna look at row zero again, and we're gonna see if there's any negative value here in this row. If there's a negative value, which we have a negative value here, that means that we have not found the optimal solution. We can still improve this. We will stop when we look at this row and we find that all coefficients are positive or zero. If you have a negative value, that means that you can still improve this solution, which is the case for this problem. We can increase X3 and we can improve this solution. So that's why we have to go to the next iteration. We know that X3 can enter the basics now. So we need to understand now who's going to leave the basics. So performing the ratio test using X3 as the entering variable yields the following results. From row one, S1 is gonna be greater or equal to zero for all values of X3 since S1 is equal to 16 plus X3. From row two, S1 is gonna be equal to zero for X3 equals uh, greater or equal to four divided by 0.5, which is eight. And from row three, X1 is gonna be greater or equal to zero. If X3 is greater than four divided by 0.25, which is 16. And for row four, S4 is gonna be greater or equal to zero for all values of X3 since S4 is equal to five. This means that to keep all the basic variables non-negative, the largest we can make X1 is the minimum between eight and 16 which is gonna be eight. So row two becomes the pivot row. So that means that um, S2 is going to leave the basics. Now we use the elementary row operations to make X3 a basic variable in row two. So let me show you that again. So I'm gonna do the same thing that I did for the first iteration. Okay, so we're gonna start with this. We're gonna start with this table. Okay, and we are gonna make now X3, right? That has to be equal to uh, 
one and the rest has to be equal to zero. So let's work with that. So I'm going to write everything again here. So these are my basic variables. Z, S1, X1, and S4. Okay, so since now I'm entering X3 and replacing that by S2, X3 is now going to be my basic variable here. All these are zeros. Okay, let me make that zeros here too. Okay, so now I'm entering X3, right? And we, and we know why, let me, let me go back to the previous tableau. So this is the last table. This is the last table after the first iteration. So the question I was asking, are we done? The answer is no. We have a negative coefficient in row zero. Okay, so that means that we can improve this solution. That also means that X3 is gonna enter the basic variable. Right now, X3 is not part of the basics. If you look at this column right here, X3 is not part of that. So I need to enter X3 to this group. In order to do that, I need to decide who's going to leave. In order to know who's going to leave, I need to check, do the minimum ratio test, right? So I'm going to, Use the coefficients from X3, and I'm going to perform the minimum ratio test by looking at the right-hand side here. So for example, in the first one, this is 16 min divided by minus one. Sorry, shouldn't be there. Mm -hmm. No, but that represents a state of here. Where is it? So what that means is that S1 is gonna be greater or zero for all values of X3, since S1 is gonna be equal to 16 plus X3. So it doesn't matter what value, if, you, if you're divided by minus one, what it means is that doesn't, it doesn't matter what value it's going to, uh, because it's not gonna affect. It can assume any values and it will remain positive. So, so yeah, remember that the, the ratio test, basically what it's trying to say is, is to do is to save us some time, but what it's representing is that you are solving for X1. Okay, so let me show you the, the process. Um, so what we are doing here is 16, so this is, is minus X3 plus, Is one 
and we are trying to solve for um, S1 to know what will be the minimum value that you can uh, increase X3 so S1 remain positive. So when we solve for S1 here, what you obtain is the following, 16 plus X3. So it doesn't matter what value you assign to X3 because it will always, since it's a positive number and X3 is greater or equal to zero, any positive number that you assign to X3 will never make S1 equal to zero or less than zero. So I, I know it's, so, so the idea again with the ratio test, if you get a negative number, what that means is it's not going to impact your solution because S1 will never be positive, will never be negative. Um, so if you do the minimum ratio test here, this will be 16 divided by not. So negative does not impact solution. Um, and then for the other one is four divided by 0.5. So that's eight. And this one is four divided by 0 0.25, 16. And then five divided by zero. This one is undefined because there's, you cannot divide by zero. So you don't take that one into account. So your ratio test is between eight and 16. The minimum out of the two is this one. So that means that S2 is going to leave the basics and X3 is going to replace X2, which is what we are explaining here and here, just went through this. So we are starting from that point. If you look at that value in that last iteration, this one was a two. So we are, I'm sorry, that was one half. So that's why we are multiplying by two, row two. So we can make that value equal to one, okay? And now we have to proceed to make this equal to zero. So what we do, we have five times row two to row zero. So this is zero now, so zero, okay? So the next step is to make this guy equal to zero. So we have row two to row one. And you see now that is zero. The next step is to make this guy zero. So we have one negative one four times row two to row three. And that is making this guy equal to zero. And after performing the elementary row operations, you get the column in the format that we needed to. So these are the basic variables, Z, S1, X3, X1, and S4. Okay, so now X3 is part of the basics. You can see that after performing the elementary rule operations, we get the, the format that we needed to. So it becomes part of the identity matrix. X3 is part of the identity matrix. X1 is part of the identity matrix. Those are basic variables now. Um, so the question, you see the objective function is improved from 240 is now 280. Um, so the question now is, are we done? Yes, the reason why is if you look at row zero, you look at the coefficients of row zero now, they're all zeros or positive coefficients. So that means that we are done. This is the best you can do, okay? So the optimal solution for this problem is saying that S1 equals 24, uh, X3 
equals eight, X one equals two, and S four equals five. Okay, so questions. Let's look at the practical meaning of this solution. What does it mean that X one equals one? What is the meaning of that? I'm sorry, X one equals two in the optimal solution. Yeah, so I, I think those were, I'd say those, let's go back to the initial statement. Let's go back to the beginning. So you're gonna produce two desk. And then what was the other value for X3, right? So the rest are going to be shares. Okay, good. What is the meaning of S4 and S, uh, I'm sorry, let's go back here. Okay, so X1 and X3 are associated with the products that you're gonna produce. So if, if you're an engineer, manufacturing plant, and you say, okay, how many you're gonna produce of this type? You're gonna answer X1 equals two is for tables, X3, I think it was shares. So these are the, the amounts that you should produce. What is the meaning of X1 equals 24? Do you have an idea? Yes, so that's what left in terms of the material. That was not used material, lumber. Okay, so in your solution, even though that is the optimal solution, you have an excess of material that is unused. Also for S4, that's one of the operations, right? I'm sorry, that's not the operation, that's the demand. Since you are not producing X2, you're basically saying that you, you had a demand of five, a maximum demand of five, but it doesn't matter because you, you never produce those products. X2 is never is not produced. So you don't you don't you don't meet that uh, constraint. So that's the practical meaning of those numbers. So we obtain, this is canonical form two. So again, what I'm doing is using these coefficients of the last table to set up the canonical form. And um, as you can see the solution right here, as I mentioned, S1 equals 24, X3 equals eight, X1 equals two and S4 equals five. Um, now solving for Z in row zero yields this. So going back to the original problem using the coefficients from that last table, you see that now those coefficients associated with row zero are negative. So what that's telling you is if you increase any of those decision variables, X2, S2, and S3, you will decrease your profit. So you should not do that. Right? If you increase X2, you're gonna decrease your profit. If you increase S2, you're gonna decrease your profit. If you increase the S3, you're gonna decrease your profit. So we can see that increasing X2, S2 or S3 while holding the other non-basic variables to zero will now, will now cause the value of Z to decrease. The solution at the end of iteration two is therefore optimal. So the optimality rule in a canonical form is optimal for a maximization problem if each non-basic variable has a non-negative coefficient in the canonical form rho zero. So summary, we, we get the solution. This is our original problem. We set up the problem in the standard form. Um, we use the simplex method, right? X1 enters, we find that in this case, the minimum ratio is four, so uh, which is associated with S3, so S3 is leaving. Then we have iteration one at, at the end of iteration one, 
we find that we have a negative coefficient here. So in X3, so X3 can enter. We do the minimum ratio test. Eight is the minimum. So we do another iteration. And in iteration two, we're able to find that all coefficients in row zero is posit are positive. So this is the optimal solution. This summary that we just, what we just did. So the optimal solution is Z equals 280, X1 equals two, X2 equals zero and X3 equals eight. Okay, so we're gonna stop here on our next lecture. We are going to discuss how to apply the simplex method for a minimization problem. And we're gonna do more examples. Um, I posted an assignment. If you wanna try to solve some of the three problems, you wanna attempt to solve those and we might discuss some of those also in class next uh, Monday. Um, so any questions? If not, then have a good weekend. I uh, will see you on Monday and let me know if you have questions. I have office hours tomorrow from 8.30 to 10.30 in the morning. Um, and that's it. Have a good day.